you know, it's literally when you have systems that are run by very wealthy and powerful people who have the ability to make and change laws, you know, then over time you can construct a system that, you know, is essentially a kleptocracy that steals money from the poor and the middle class and just hands it to the wealthy. That being so uh, specifically constructed was not something I really had thought about. And I think that was the biggest takeaway for me about the story and, and its importance. This is Phantom Hampton, stories from where the rest of us live. Phantom Hampton is a podcast about the 99% living in the 1% world of the Hamptons. This week's episode is called The Gory Details. It's my look at two groundbreaking films on this year's Hamptons Film Festival roster, The Panama Papers and To Dust. I interviewed Alex Winter, the director of the Panama Papers, which is having its world premiere at the Hamptons International Film Festival. His last film, The Deep Web, and his new film, The Trust Machine, are also about secrets and anonymity. This movie was co-produced by Laura Poitras, who made Risk and Citizen Four. The Panama Papers is a start-to-finish thriller about global money laundering. Like Julian Assange and Edward Snowden before him, the Panama Papers leaker is a whistleblower who aims to be our global conscience. The film starts when a person calling themselves John Doe offers access to documents from the Panamanian law firm Mossack Fonseca to two relatively unknown journalists. The digital documents reveal the identities of key players in the secret world of the law firm's wealthy clients. Hey, how are you? I'm okay. <laughs> but I saw the film. Yeah. Um, well, how did you get involved in this great project? You know, I've, I've made a couple of films that deal... I mean, the last film I made dealt with sort of an investigative topic and covered investigative journalists as well as other people trying to uncover what was going on with the Silk Road black market. I watched it, the deep web. It was really great. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Kara. Um, and uh, then I made a couple of short films for Field of Vision, one of which was about a you know, journalist, Barrett Brown, who was getting out of prison. You know, I'm interested in stories about two things for me. One is I'm interested in stories about investigative journalists because I feel like they are really the unsung heroes of our of our immediate presence and not just Trump but just in the way the world is working in general and then also I felt that you know I'm often film wise drawn to stories that I don't feel or have been given the public exposure or response or gravitas that they deserve you know in the case of the Panama Papers it's interesting because it certainly was all over the news but it it didn't stick and it largely didn't stick because it's, you know, it's a bipartisan issue. Both sides of the political aisle are guilty. And I just think everyone, everyone in power, you know, both in politics and corporations and just, you know, certain rich actors in general just wanted this story to go away, did not want it to hold. So it was kind of given its moment and then quickly buried. So that made me interested in giving it a, uh, you know, a, a big, broad documentary, um, you know, examination. I didn't hear anybody mention Clinton's or Obama's, but I did hear people say that over 3,000 times, dear Donald's last name was in these documents. But that doesn't mean that they're not in there. Well, it's not it's not really that cut and dried. It's not really about presidents. It's really about about entire structures of government and business. You know, all of those structures are implicated. It's not necessarily a a big name sort of juicy headline as much as the systemic corruption that we're talking about is really perpetrated by everybody. It's not just perpetrated by those on the right. 
I mean, we discussed Trump specifically in the movie because the film is coming out during the Trump administration. And, you know, there's a lot that's going on in terms of looking at his it's very rare to have a president who was a businessman who was so heavily and blatantly involved in offshore. Yeah. And still uh, is. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of names on the left, yes, you will find Justin Trudeau, um, you know, connection to major players within his administration and contacts in uh, leaks involving offshore and this type of corruption. I mean, if it's it's everywhere. It's Nike, it's Apple, it's every major corporation for the most part, most major government players. You know, the government in Iceland was not a far right government that went down. And so it's it's really looking at, you know, a systemic problem that can't just be easily labeled as a partisan problem. And those are thorny and they tend to not get a lot of traction in the media. How did you get 23 journalists to agree to talk to you on camera? for this film. They probably felt similarly to the way I did, which is that it's a story that they're very proud of, but also one that they felt could use more amplification. So I, you know, like any film that I do, I needed to make my, my intentions very, very clear with them, but then they also have to trust me, you know, because it, you know, it is, it is our film and we're going to tell sort of our perspective on the story, earning their trust. Did you pick them because you had had some former contact with them and they might trust you? Because what I'm getting at is they were very afraid before this was released. But are people still afraid about talking about this? Yes, yeah, some people are. Some people are more willing than others. I mean, Daphne Galicia was assassinated like right in the middle of while I was shooting. Um, so that was well after well after the, the, the papers went to publication. I mean, almost, you know, well over a year after they went to publication, year and a half. You know, yes, there are still dangers involved in these stories. Um, they are, the entire landscape is something that many, many people wish would just go away. And then the specificity of it is, you know, is threatening to a lot of different people who are implicated. For me, I, I approached those particular journalists because I knew that I, you know, I couldn't possibly tell, you know, the story involved 400, of roughly 400 journalists that were working, you know, during the course of the, the paper story being put together and over six, 700 on the story after publication. I, you know, I couldn't make a movie that focused on that many people. It was impossible. So I, I made a targeted list of some of the people around the world that I knew were deeply embedded. It doesn't by any means mean that they were the you know, the most embedded. They were just the ones that I selected. And then it was very important to me to talk to Bastian and Frederick at the Sedoitsche Zeitung um, because they were the ones who got the leak in the first place. And it was very important for me to talk to the ICIJ who basically oversaw the whole campaign uh, in wrangling, you know, these many hundreds of journalists. That was very cool to learn about them and to learn about their mission. And, you know, because of the way that news is changing, you know, the internet is not bound by nationhood. So now these stories are so big that they really can't be handled safely or effectively by one news outlet. No, they can't. And, you know, and also in this era when journalists and the news are under siege, both, you know, by nefarious actors that want to dismiss, you know, what they're reporting or silence what they're reporting in the case of autocratic governments, you know, and also because economically they're they're so overburdened, um, and a lot of these papers are closing. I mean, many of the papers, or some of the papers that cover the story, are now gone. It is a kind of a, a period of great threat for journalism on a number of fronts. And uh, you know, it was also important to me to talk to Rita and Scott in Panama for you know the simple reason that they were, in my mind, um, taking a great risk because they were reporting the story right in the seat of where everything had erupted. Oh my God. And she said she had friends that she was having dinner with and they had no idea she was investigating them. That must have been really frightening for her. Yeah, it's pretty harrowing. And they're still doing great reporting in Panama, you know, right now. So it's not like they were chased out. Um, they, they held their ground. So did the reporters in, in Russia um, under great threat. They held their ground and they're still reporting. These guys are, are doing heroic work Right now, I mean, the Panama Papers is a vast trove of data that will be revealing new, you know, new stories 
for years. Most of the journalists you interviewed were asking themselves, how do we make this fresh? You know, every week there's a story about corruption and everybody's pretty jaded and used to it. How do we make people understand that this is personal? This money's being stolen from you, from your social services. It's just not that sexy a story, tax evasion, unless you're committing it. <laughs> So yeah, I mean that's that's where I think a movie is useful. The movies are very good at at really concentrating, uh, especially documentaries, on really concentrating on what can be very nuanced and complex or dismissible subjects, and giving them a sort of dramatic emphasis. That's the thing that thematically that I really wanted to show was that for me, people don't care that the rich lie and hide their money and do nefarious things because they've been propagandized. It isn't because it isn't a big deal. It's because it has been so heavily propagandized. Banks, lobbyists, politicians, media outlets are funded by you know huge organisms of this very corrupt system. So a lot of the news and the information that we get, both from our politicians and from our even you know large news organizations, can be skewed in their favor. And it was really important to show that this is a systemic problem and it's been propagandized. If you're thinking that it doesn't matter that you know the lion's share of the money that we need for public services around the world is being stolen, then you've been propagandized to not care about that. Just like we've been propagandized over decades to not care about you know, rampant sexual harassment, which is now you know, coming out through the Me Too movement, it's not like those things were never bad. We had been propagandized to say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't happen as much as people say. It's not that big a deal. Like the reason most, you know, so many Americans don't use their vote. It's total defeatism. But one of the things I thought that the film, as you said, a documentary might be able to get people agitated more. I watched it like a thriller, and you started with the two guys from uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, you know, getting the, the text message in the middle of the night. So I thought that it really did achieve what the sense of it, it being a cliffhanger and um, you know, it was really impossible to stop watching it once I started. Yeah, excellent. Well, that was, that was the idea, was to construct it like a political thriller, which is really what it was, and to try to put your, I mean, Films are, are good at, at making things ex directly experiential. And I really wanted people to feel what it was like for these two, you know, well-respected, but basically relatively unknown and underdog journalists who are handed the scoop of a, a lifetime. And what do they do with it? And how do they make sure that it's protected and gets out into the world properly? Right. And that they made that choice to give it to the ICIJ is, is very clear, too, uh, which I loved. I loved that they that they took hammers to their iPhones and their Macs. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. What was the most surprising thing you learned that you you thought you knew going in, but you were like, oh, my God. You know, I think it's what Luke Harding says. His his epiphany was very similar to my epiphany it was as I was working on it. It really became kind of jaw droppingly clear that this wasn't a case of thousands of documented and verifiable acts of criminality, it was revealing an entire system. It was revealing essentially how our economy works. It is income inequality is really a, a systemic issue that has been, it's by design. It isn't by happenstance. And that was really staggering to me. You know, it's literally when you have systems that are run by very wealthy and powerful people who have the ability to make and change laws, you know, then over time you can construct a system that you know, is essentially a kleptocracy that steals money from the poor and the middle class and just hands it to the wealthy. That being so uh, specifically constructed was not something I really had thought about. And I think that was the biggest takeaway for me about the story and, and its importance. I remember that, that I pulled that quote because, he, you know, he said, oh, yeah, I thought this would, might be a little part of what was going on. But this is the economic system, he said. I found that very striking. So that came through. Well, near French Revolution levels of economic inequality. I forget the woman who said that. 
Marina Walker. Yeah, the head of the one of the heads of the ICIJ. Your most surprising interview for the film. You know, I love talking to people and, you know, especially super intelligent, interesting people. I'd say, you know, Jack Blum, you know, the IRS investigator, and he's a very, very highly regarded lawyer, you know, was very revealing. It was one of the interviews I did early on. And, you know, oftentimes these types of films are like investigations themselves. And there's a lot of our discussion that isn't in the finished film, but it really, it was very, very illuminating and powerful because Jack, has been around and dealt with these cases long before the Panama Papers story broke. And what I liked about my interview with Jack was that it really showed me, you know, a lot of times it can seem to the public that these things just kind of pop out of thin air. You know, talking to Jack, it's really evidence that, you know, there have been really dogged people, brave people who have been trying to get the public to understand for decades how they're being robbed and how the middle class is being destroyed and how, you know, the working and lower classes are being kept poor. The systemic problem that, you know, I became aware of because of the Panama Papers has been going on for a long time. And I don't mean, you know, it's human nature has been going on for as long as there's been human civilization, but the specific economic construct that we have, you know, has been going on for a long time. Talking to Jack was very, we all walked away so blown away by by the gravity and breadth of the corruption. Uh, probably the most emotional interview I did personally was with Rita Vasquez in Panama. And I was saying it wasn't emotional for her, I don't think, because she's a tough cookie. And But it was just really evidence to me. It's one thing for all these European and American, you know, and other global journalists to expose this wrongdoing. And it took a huge amount of courage. You know, obviously for people in Russia... Uh, China, places where you can get killed, you know, huge. But Rita was really uniquely vulnerable for two reasons, because she was having to expose corruption within her very own home and backyard where she had to earn a living and face everyone every day in a very small country where everyone knows each other, right. uh, including people that she knew. Because as I said, this is this is a, a type of corruption. A lot of people say, well, they do it. Why can't I do it? And, you know, so good people have been implicated in this because they've a lot looked. of it is is legal it's on the edge of legality well yeah some of it is legal the way slavery was legal it's just why it's wildly unethical but they have bent the laws to make it legal so just oftentimes what gets misunderstood because just because something is not illegal doesn't make it right slavery was legal it wasn't right you know but the other major thing that i think rita had to face was you know i would say a kind of faint bigotry on the part of a lot of other people, probably even including some of her journalistic colleagues who sort of looked at Panama in general as this backwater. You know, yeah. And, and dismissed it and, and, you know, had also kind of dumped the whole essence of the corruption at the doorstep of Panama. When of course, this isn't a story about Panamanian corruption. It's a story about global corruption. The Panama Papers was named that because well, really, because it sounded good, I'm sure, but because the law firm was based in Panama, but their law, their offices were all over the world, including the U.S. I felt that someone like Rita really had to deal with kind of a constellation of prejudice. That interview was very powerful to me for that reason, because I just felt she really just kind of barreled ahead and just took on what she had to take on regardless of that. Is there anything that you got on film that you couldn't include that you regret? There's a lot of stuff that I got on film that I couldn't include that I don't regret because it would have put people in danger. Did you start uh, interviewing people right after the papers came out? No, I started I started after the papers came out. Was this like a two year process or? Yeah, it was it was it was a year and a half long, two year long process, basically. end to end. So people were more comfortable with um, with being known as being part of. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't have, nobody would have talked to me before publication. There's no way. No, of course. No, no. But there were some shots of things that I thought, how did he get this footage? Somebody was filming this inside the room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I love Laura. Po Do you say po Poitras? Films too. Yeah. Risk was at the Take Two documentary festival last year, and yeah, I loved it. I love Risk. Citizen Four, she must must be amazing to 
to get together and work on a project with her company. Yeah, I mean, I actually came to Laura with this because I'd worked on two short films for her organization, Field of Vision, and really enjoyed the process of working with her and Charlotte Cook from Field of Vision. So I, I just felt that it would be very helpful to the film to have her oversight, which it was, obviously. Your subject matter seems to be a lot about secrecy and anonymity. They seem always to be about things just under the radar. And I'm interested in, in the shift of society from, you know, into a, a, a landscape where privacy is not considered a right anymore and that we are giving up that right and what the implications of that are because they're they're overlooked a giant breach you know of your of your health insurer or your photographs or you realize that facebook is is data mining you then people start to freak out but that's that's so late like that's by then it's already it's already too late so you know i'm interested in that and i'm also very interested in stories because you know we have and it's not conspiratorial we culture tends to define what stories it does and does not want predominantly told. There's a reason why the New York Times and the Washington Post and other big papers didn't, you know, rejected the Panama Papers leak when it went to, when it came to them, you know, and only picked the story up, you know, I would say quasi begrudgingly after it was broken by the other journalists. There are just narratives that are not usually given free reign to be discussed. And those are often narratives that I'm interested in in exploring. Oh, have you arrived? No, I'm here. I'm good. Yeah, I just closed my car door. To, um, I was always interested in counter narrative. I was interested in that when I was young. I was interested in that when I was in film school. Hey, you have another documentary that you just had a, a, a press screening for simultaneously, yes. sort of? What's that? Um, I made another tech doc, sort of my third tech doc about new technology, the information age you know, global internet-based communities. So it's about cryptocurrency and blockchain. Yeah, that's Trust Machine, yep. Yeah, that's not viewable yet, but it will be. Soon. We're, we're going to do a small theatrical in New York and L.A., and then it'll come out wide. Oh, this was so nice to talk to you about this. Yeah. Uh, what was the freeway you were just the driving? The 10, west to the west side. How is it yeah. in L.A. these days? It's great. I love it. I actually love it here. It's taken me 30 years to love L.A., but I genuinely do now, so... <laughs> thanks it was really great to great to talk to you yeah i love the movie i told people i was writing an article about something called the panama papers P educated people in my writing group like three of them said what's that well that's, that's why we made the movie <laughs> <laughs> that's got to change <laughs> yeah it's got to change okay alex i'll let you go Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Okay, bye. bye. To Dust is a darkly comic first feature film directed by Sean Snyder and produced by husband and wife team Alessandra Nivola, who has recently starred in Disobedience, and his wife Emily Mortimer, a star of The Newsroom and Doll and N. These are longtime Amagansett locals and well loved actors. Into Dust, Gaze of Rorick plays a Hasidic cantor having trouble coping with the death of his wife. Searching for relief from gruesome nightmares about his wife's decaying body, he finds a community biology professor, Matthew Broderick, somehow willing to teach him more about the process. To Dust is category-defying and all the more rich for it. Besides being a comedy and drama, it is also partly a horror film, a buddy film, a road picture, and at moments a Howard Hawks-esque slapstick. And yet somehow it manages to be low-key and a profound and moving examination of grief from multiple perspectives. So I wanted to talk to you about um, To Dust, which I actually was able to see. Oh, good. You got you saw. Cool. Where did you, how did you see it? Oh, I saw it because I told Hiff that um, 
Oh, cool. So they just uh, send you a link or something. Excellent. Uh, yeah, it's such a sweet, beautiful film. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I really liked it. <laughs> but I was interested in um, the idea of, that you and Emily produced it. And if you wanted to talk about what kind of producing, you know, there's so sure. many levels of it, but how involved you were. Um, yeah, we were as involved as anyone could possibly be to the point where we had the cinematographer living in my mom's apartment and we're driving him to Staten Island at five in the morning every day over the over the Verrazano Bridge um, uh, <laughs> That's but, great. Um, we started this company called King B uh, about five years ago or maybe six in order initially just to produce Doll and M, which was the television show that M wrote and starred in for HBO with her best friend Dolly Wills. And I have to watch that. You've got to that. see it. It's really, really great. And it was kind of pioneering in a way. It was a germ of, of an idea that they had. And we we started talking to our friend Azazel Jacobs about it, who's a great indie filmmaker. Initially, we were gonna we were gonna make an indie film, and we got together in Los Angeles while Emily was shooting the newsroom, uh, which was also for HBO and just with no money at all, just, just, um, shot like 20 minutes of, of footage based on that was improvised. Um, just based on this idea of two best friends, one who's a, a movie star and the other one who's down on her luck. Uh, and the movie star hi hires her best friend to be her personal assistant. And oh, so I remember it, this it, idea. I think you were talking yeah. about it way, way back when. Yeah. yeah, it was a long, like first we were talking about it maybe being a play and then a movie. And But so as it came over and just shot on a Canon 5D, like not even a film camera really, it's sort of 20 minutes and edited it together there were no lights no makeup nothing and um cut it together just as a kind of promo uh that i was going to raise money with it just was so good that it felt like an episode of a of a television show instead of a, a movie and we just decided hell let's just see what happens if we you know em and dolly were over in england and over the summer and and we sent it to the person who had produced the broadcast executive who had been behind Michael Winterbottom's The Trip that starred Steve Coogan, which was kind of the inspiration for the show in terms of Steve Coogan playing a version of himself and his friend playing a version of himself and kind of riffing on their real life personalities, but not really and having it be kind of, exaggerated and hilarious and so we brought it to the woman who had made that show at the bbc and she was now working at b sky b she watched this 20 minutes and just loved it and said we want to commission the whole thing and not only that we want this to be the pilot episode and you shouldn't change a thing wow and so that's how it started and and so we we put this company together I had never produced anything at the time. I produced it. We then made two seasons and sold it to HBO. And it was just this great success for us, having never done anything like that and um, not really knowing our ass from our elbows as far as how to go about it. And we just learned. Isn't that the way to do um, things, though? Because if you knew initially how hard they would be, you would say, oh, well, this is impossible. <laughs> Definitely, definitely would never have gone anywhere near anything like this. But yeah, it was um, just like bullshitting a lot, pretending to sound like I knew what I was talking about, <laughs> having no idea. And then um, by the end of the second season, I actually really did know what I was talking about, sometimes learning the hard way, but, but I had definitely gotten a lot of experience from it. And and at that point, we decided, hey, you know, I think that it would be a good idea to grow this company out a little bit and, and get a little bit more ambitious and start trying to develop more than one thing at once. Didn't you tell me at one time that you and Emily switch off projects so that you're both not gone at the same 
time working and so because of your children and yeah we try we try and stagger stuff acting wise as much as we can um it doesn't always work out that way but um we weren't necessarily thinking of it that way it was more just came out of the fact that we'd gotten to a point where we had worked with a lot of great people and we really knew some of the best filmmakers and writers and uh, directors and and we had these like high class educations that had just been going to total waste. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's uh, right. And it just seemed like we should maybe you know put all those elements to work somehow and and just you know get involved in in making movies from from every angle instead of just one. That was the, our our reason. And then it just was. And then there's something really satisfying about having just a, a germ of an idea and then uh, developing it uh, and having it come to fruition. Um, of course, it's also just deeply frustrating a lot of the time. But we were maybe unfortunately lucky to have it be so easy the first time around because we were <laughs> lulled into this false sense that, that uh, it might be like this every time. And, and of course, it, it rarely is. Anyway, so we got this. So this company then then started to grow, and we people after the success of Don M wanted to uh, a lot of a lot of studios wanted to do like first look deals with us, and we made a first look deal sort of overhead deal with um, a studio called E One Entertainment One that you know they make sharp objects and Fear the Walking Dead and all kinds of things, um, and they they made a two year deal with us. And suddenly, you know, we had uh, an office and two people working with us now, you know, two development executives. And it was really like uh, the real deal all of a sudden. We've got like 10 different television shows in development that, that E1 have bought and are putting together with writers. And, you know, we're developing Ann Patchett's Ten? book. Yeah, they're all in different stages of development and being written and but there are a couple that are actually written that are about to be pitched to broadcasters. And, but yeah, you kind of have to have a lot of things going at once because you don't ever know what's going to kind of mm. catch, catch fire. And, and um, if you just have one project at a time, you could wait 10 years before you make anything. Right. The story of to yeah. dust, how did that come about? So to dust uh, came about, M was, was, um, judging a screenwriting competition for the Sloan Institute, Tribeca Film Institute comp screenwriting competition. And she was reading through just like 50 scripts for this, you know, as being part of this jury. Huh. And she came to one that, uh, that she really liked and she gave it to me and I loved it. We decided that it was something that we thought we'd like to try and get made and we thought we could do it on a modest scale and and uh you know of course we hadn't really taken into account what it would be like to get a pig to do what you wanted to do and <laughs> um, <but laughs> it seemed like it might be manageable and we met the director and he was this really bright guy he'd gone to harvard and nyu film school and he had a really strong idea of how he wanted to make it and, uh, yeah um and we really just liked him personally. And so so we just said, listen, we want to make this with you. And, and he was thrilled. And we got together with Ron Perlman's company, who, who gave us our first piece of money, along with, well, it also, it won that, that uh, grant from the, the Sloan Foundation. We had a, a, you know, a little bit of money to start out with, and then we just started cobbling it together. And it took two years for us to raise the money, but eventually... We, we kind of actually made it happen. And we the cinematographer was somebody that he shoots a lot of um, Brad Anderson's movies, like The Machinist with Christian Bale. And he had shot Trans-Siberian that Emily was in. And he's a Spaniard. So well, yeah, the cinematography is in. beautiful. Yeah. And oh. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really high class. And we brought him in and he did it for next to nothing. I mean, just like incredible labor of love we were just so flattered by having people like him be willing to work on it but they all really responded to the script i mean that wasn't just a favorite to us all the people that we got to work on it were just like 
felt like it was really original and would give them an, a chance to express themselves as as artists as well. And if those kind of actors hadn't been of the caliber that they were, walking that fine line between the deep <laughs> complexity of these characters and they didn't yeah. they didn't characterize them in any way you felt like there was respect on all sides and yet you know the gefilte fish going down the toilet i mean it's really funny <laughs> it's really funny <laughs> uh, well it's yeah that was always the question of like that you know the tone which was so unique and unusual and as we were raised, putting the money together there were people who read it who were skeptical that you could marry uh, you know a comedy with with subject matter about about death and rotting corpses and things and um it's part horror <laughs> story part comedy part buddy film yeah. part road movie yeah. and something else oh drama <laughs> It's part yeah, well, you you nailed it, and I, you know, it's hard to pitch that. Um, we, you know, we were so lucky with the casting because Geza, um, a lot of people know as the star of that movie, Son of Saul, which was the Hungarian Holocaust film that won best best foreign film Oscar a couple of years ago, and he had been. Um, that movie had been released by Sony Classics and Sony had put out so many of the movies that I've been in from Junebug to Laurel Canyon to Coco Before Chanel to, uh, I mean, just like it feels like half the movies I've been in, they released. And I've gotten to be really close with Dylan Liner, who's one of the main executives there. And he read it and he said, you know, there's only one guy who can play this, Geza. And, uh, and he was the one who arranged a meeting with, with him and Sean, the director, and, and with me and M. And Geza just loved it the minute he read it. And so the fact that we had him right from the start just like gave us a lot of confidence that that, that really tricky piece of casting we wouldn't have to look any further for. And then Matthew is, is a friend of ours, and he's a neighbor of ours in Amagansett, in fact. Uh, lives just down the road from us. We just called him up and said, we have a very odd and interesting proposition for you. And uh, you have to kind of take a chance on us, but we think that it could be a great role for you and that you'll really shine in it. And that the two of you would be such a kind of great, unlikely pairing. Yes. Um, <laughs> that it'll definitely get, you know, get, get people's attention and he read it and loved it too and so like we just had it cat you know the sort of a dream cast came together really really uh easy and easily and naturally the children and the mother i mean everybody was just perfect yeah well that was you know laura rosenthal who is also a neighbor of ours in brooklyn who's one of the top casting directors in new york and she uh, she came on at a big cut rate as well because she loved the material and and we had a good personal relationship with her and and so she was the person who really kind of found all of those other wonderful actors that she brought to Sean. These guys have been definitely rewarded. Their performances have been so praised and so I think uh, Matthew feels like despite the sort of <laughs> brutally uh unglamorous shoot that that it was it was worth it for him to slum it this last year has been the sort of has been the year of orthodox judaism for me because total weird coincidence that i had been um you know we'd already been working on this film for a couple of years as i said it took a fair amount of time to put all the money together and make it actually happen and in it was in that time that we were still cobbling things together that I was offered that role with Rachel Weiss and, and Rachel McAdams in Disobedience, where I was going to be playing a Hasidic rabbi. <laughs> and, um, you yeah, know, I just couldn't believe I kept coming into the office every week as I was growing that three month beard. And I was slowly starting to look more and more like Shmuel, the character that, that Geza was playing and playing. <laughs> It just became this on running joke. What worked out so well for us was that I, in doing all this research for that role, I got to be really close with some Orthodox 
Lubavitch people in Crown Heights. Mm. And there was this one family in particular, and this guy Zalman Raxin, who had kind of taken me under his wing and was, was teaching me how to pronounce all this, these Hebrew blessings that I had to say in disobedience, and just like a lot of the physical stuff that I, I needed to get familiar with and you know down to little details about my clothing and how I would wear it and all those things and I so I was hanging around with him and his family all through the build-up to filming Disobedience and then once I finished shooting Disobedience we we this thing came together just only a couple of months later and Zalman ended up becoming the Hasidic advisor on to dust and then played a role in it himself and his son is in it too, playing that kind of school bully on the on the playground. Oh yeah, playground. that bully, yeah. He really helped us, you know, bridge the divide to to bring in you know people from the real Orthodox community and to also allow us to be accurate and respectful of that community so that we were um, doing it right. Did he play the rabbi? No, no, no. That guy is a is a wonderful actor named Ben Hammer, who sadly passed away. He was 90-something years old, and this was his, his last film. And it killed and, him. Um, it, it, <laughs> I, I did him in. Um, he was an amazing guy. And he actually had been in Wizard of Lies with me, the De Niro Madoff movie that I did, Barry Levinson, and that was just the year before. So I'd known him. He was just fantastic, but he never lived long enough to see the finished movie, which is such a shame because he's so good in it. Is that um is that the actor actually singing the cantor's song at the beginning and the end? Yeah, he doesn't sing it at the beginning. The beginning is a woman singing it, um, and then he sing he sings it at the end. He's got a such a beautiful and unusual sounding voice. It's such a treat at, at Tribeca, and we won the audience award and. Sean won Best First Time Feature Award, and then we got picked up for, for distribution in, in February, so it's going to come out in theaters then. It's been really, in, ultimately, a great experience along the way. I mean, it was, hot, it was really hard. We were shooting in Staten Island, and we, had just, we just had no money to, for anything, and so we were trying to do it all ourselves and found locations that we could afford there, you know, that that uh, were still like accessible to the city and but it's so hard there's no transport there's no public transportation there so just getting the crew out there every day was just a nightmare and we were transporting people ourselves and anyway it was <laughs> it's not it's not for the faint of heart <laughs> what's the craziest thing that happened during the shoot oh man well just god i don't know i guess that I, you can talk know. about yeah yeah well there <laughs> well there was a there was a park ranger who like flipped his lid one night because he didn't think we'd had our equipment out of there in time or something. And <laughs> he started like hurling furniture around and Matthew was trapped in his like little like closet dressing room where he had been <laughs> changing out of his costume and he was too afraid to come out. And uh, <laughs> we got some like call from him saying, um, <laughs> I think that the, uh, the park ranger might be trying to kill me. And uh, and so we, we had to come over and Emily sort of sweet talked this guy and and uh, charmed him out of his murderous instinct. Oh, that's great! That's very great. <laughs> Say hello yeah, to please. everyone. Maybe I'll cross paths with you at the festival. But say hello to your probably giant children and your beautiful wife and your mom <laughs> i definitely will my son is like two years from leaving to get a car it's just crazy he's about to turn 15 unbelievable i can't believe you can even make movies <laughs> if you have a 15 year old I mean, well no he's like completely doesn't want to have anything to do with us it's my, my eight-year-old is the one that oh thank you so much for this chat it was lovely oh uh, yeah no Thanks for doing it. It's, it's, it's great. That sounds like a cool um, new publication. Okay. <laughs>